Living off the power grid doesn't mean you have to live in the woods. More and more urban dwellers are switching to solar power. For most, it's their way to conserve energy and natural resources, while also gaining self-sufficiency and lower utility bills. But for others, disconnecting from the grid is a way to prepare for disaster. A random search on the internet for off-the-grid living connects to sites that focus on how to survive a doomsday scenario. Subscribers to these sites might identify themselves as preppers or as part of the readout movement, a loosely organized network of people across the country who communicate primarily through the web about how to prepare and survive catastrophe and the collapse of society. Many are drawn to the remote lands of the Northwest, including Idaho, where they feel they can better protect themselves from impending anarchy. In troubled times, even average people find themselves preparing for the unknown. But most off-grid living is not based on conspiracy theory and fear. Morning, Stella Bella. School day. It's a morning ritual for parents and children all over the country. But for this family, there's no blow dryer for their hair, no toaster for their bread. There's no checking the weather on TV or zapping leftovers in the microwave. And a drive to the school bus stop can mean sharing the road with another species. Don't run off. Just another day on the homestead. The homestead is three acres in the mountains about an hour from Boise. Since 2013, Esther Emery and her husband, Nick Fouch, have lived on the property with their three children. Fouch built what they call the little house from the ground up, including cutting and milling the logs. It's also totally off the power grid. For us, being off-grid isn't about a set of rules and regulations, and it certainly isn't about some particular evil that needs to be banished from your life. It's about intentional living every single moment. A unique wood-burning unit called a rocket mass heater keeps the house warm and LED lamps provide light. A small solar system charges a computer and two phones there's no cell service, but there is internet. Propane fuels a mini refrigerator and an on-demand water heater. And a generator runs Nick's tools, but nothing else that draws much power, like a washing machine or a television, is here. I'll just set them in the holes for you, Stella Bella. It's all part of a very deliberate decision to live closer to the land. Perfect. And to their children. So we're gonna grow a cornfield. A family and the land are in relationship so that the family's work improves the land while also improving the conditions of the family. Oh, look. For Nick, that's meant building everything on the grounds himself. For Esther, gardening has provided a deep satisfaction. So the key to our gardening method here is landforming. We've actually shaped the land here to capture water and to also hold heat. And my gardens have just exploded since I learned how to do this. One thing that did not prompt their lifestyle change was fear of a governmental collapse. We are trained to take responsibility for our own survival, but we are not preppers. It hasn't been easy. For three years, all five of them lived in this yurt while Fouch built their home. Okay, I want you to practice these today, okay? Esther homeschooled the children. And it felt so bold and brave, and I loved that. But the day-to-day -day was pretty challenging. In the heat of the summer, we were hot, and in the cold of the winter, we were cold. But I think we both had our times when we felt like it was too much, and thankfully we didn't have a whole lot of options. So we're still here. <laughs> Today, the homestead supports a menagerie of animals and a large garden, both of which provide much of the family's food. It's a cantaloupe and watermelon. You grew it yourself, and so you can be so proud of that. 
That Esther should be doing this at all is perhaps predictable, but also a bit ironic. You see, her mother was a pioneer in the modern homesteading movement of the 1970s. Carla Emery wrote what was at the time considered the Bible for living simply, called the Encyclopedia of Country Living. Her daughter, though, was not impressed. She actually taught a session teaching people how to kill and butcher a chicken. And as a teenager in the 90s, that was appalling to me. I have this mom who kills chickens. No one does that. That's a peasant thing to do. That's an old fashioned thing to do. Hi, girl. The older she got, though, the more her mom's views made sense. And I started really craving that connection, almost accidentally stepping back into my own family legacy. This chicken was one of our chickens. We baked the chicken this morning, and then we... It's possible that I helped pluck it. And then we took, it's very possible, and then we took the meat off the bone, and we, um, we turned it into casserole. Now I look at my mother's heritage with pride. I can appreciate what she offered to the world and really in some ways take up her banner. Do you know what it would take to slow yourself down? One of the ways she does that is by sharing their experiences on YouTube. The videos are so popular that income from ads has helped support the family, in addition to Nick's freelance carpentry work in defense of doing hard things. Esther is upfront about explaining to her audience what's worked for them and admitting what hasn't. An early experiment doing laundry by pedaling a bicycle, for instance, has gone by the wayside in favor of doing it in town. Perhaps the biggest change is that she no longer homeschools her children. We've definitely had some people feel that we betrayed the movement by sending our kids to school. But what we want is to have capable, resilient children. Who, they're not going to live on the homestead forever and ever. Absolutely. We're trying to make citizens of the world, not mm -hmm. copies of ourselves, you know. One line in the sand that's pretty firm, though, is no television. We have too many wonderful, enjoyable activities around for them to engage in, to need television. Yep. In many ways, it's the ultimate free-range childhood, a quality that's vanished from so many families. Whether it's finding salamanders under rocks. Oh, there's two. Climbing a high tree or getting in a good swing. There's plenty of space for choice and imagination. I tamed a dragon this morning. It was a huge red one with huge horns, and it was pretty big. You can actually just go inside the tree, and I caught my castle. It grows raspberries and June berries. I do not get lonely, because I have a really entertaining sister. <laughs> Trees! Trees are my friends, too. Plants, of course. <laughs> it's a very special Christmas Eve, the first one in the little house. The whole family helps pick a Christmas tree from their property. This was a family tradition for my family. All afternoon, they make decorations together. And as evening descends, they share moments of wonder and gratitude. <laughs> For Esther and Nick, it's these moments that make all the hard work worthwhile. For us, it's about having a meaningful life. We didn't want to lie down at the end of our walk and say, I ran in circles for 40 years. We wanted to say that we lived every moment, that we were present, that we were healthy, that we did the things we wanted to do, that we weren't afraid. 